Hello and welcome to the program. My name is Luke Hunt. This is another podcast for the Beyond the Mekong program, which is broadcast by The Diplomat. And with me today is Jason Tower, who is the country director for the United States Institute for Peace. And he has been tightly involved with everything that's happening in Myanmar, the civil war, and also scam compounds, human trafficking, and that also touches on other areas in the region. Jason, welcome to the program. Thanks, Luke, for having me on. I've been wanting to chat with you for quite some time. Uh, Where do you see the situation at the moment in Burma? Because we have this long-running civil war, and uh, Asian leaders keep talking about negotiating with the junta, which, according to my last estimates and what I'm reading, the military only controls 14% of the country. Where do you see this going over the next few months and perhaps further forward? Yeah, we've seen some pretty dramatic developments uh, of late in in Burma, in particular uh, in the northern part of the country. Uh, You've seen where a coalition of ethnic armed organizations together with some of the People's Defense Forces that are under the National Unity Government of of Myanmar, that's the uh, parallel government that has been set up by the elected parliamentarians that were deposed after the, the military coup back in 2021, Uh, Mm -hmm. But you've seen this coalition launch a second phase of what is referred to as Operation 1027. So Operation 1027 started uh, last October, October 27th, to be exact, and that's where the the name for that operation comes from. But basically what that did was it um, eradicated a lot of the scam syndicates from the China-Myanmar border. It led to the defeat of uh, the Myanmar military's border guard force along the China border, uh, bringing the territory known as Kokong, which is uh, uh, adjacent to one of the key um, uh, transit points on the China-Myanmar economic corridor, brought that whole territory under the control of the resistance. And then following that, after a couple months long pause that was Uh, triggered by a a ceasefire demanded by the PRC, you saw where that operation flared up once again, starting in June after the talks that were being brokered by China Mm -hmm. and the Brotherhood Alliance of Resistance Actors and the military. Uh, After those talks collapsed, you saw um, another very rapid uh, movement towards the Burman heartland by these resistance groups. And, you know, I think it was a very significant defeat that was delivered to the Myanmar military in uh, early August. The city of Washu fell to resistance forces, as well as uh, adjacent territories, including towns where you have uh, many of the ruby mines, also um, up in uh, northern Shan State. But but basically, the the, the key point to emphasize here is that the Myanmar military lost roughly 50,000 square kilometers of territory since last October. It's lost most of the key uh, transit points for trade along the border with China. And most significant of all, it lost its northeastern command. So the entire command headquarters tasked yep. with meaning the military's operations up in northern Shan State also fell. So that, that's kind of where things are at mm-hmm. the moment. You've seen where China, once again, has become very proactive in trying to push parties back to the table. And you've also seen where China's posture towards the military has shifted a little bit. This time last year, it was much more hostile towards the Myanmar military. At this point, it's really, I think, leaning in a little bit more, providing the military with more open assistance and trying to bring the military back into a lot of regional platforms. And so uh, the resistance seems now to be under very significant pressure from China, despite these recent successes on the battlefield. Right. The latest I'm hearing is that the bit of a redeployment going on around Mandalay and there's a prospect that Mandalay could fall by the end of this year. Is that realistic? And uh, how would that upset the balance given China's involvement, perceptions of who's in charge of Myanmar? And what are the chances of the military actually hanging on? I think after Washu fell, it really did send a chill through the military, but mm-hmm. also a chill through China insofar as, you know, China's objectives on the border were to deal with transnational crime and to try to manufacture some type of a ceasefire deal with an eye towards getting belligerent parties 
particularly the ethnic armed organizations that China has dealt with for, for decades, mm-hmm. uh, getting those parties and the military on the same page in terms of you know, ending hostilities, de-escalating, uh, and ultimately enabling uh, China to reset trade. I think you've seen where China's become now much more aggressive towards the ethnic armed organizations mm-hmm. than it had been, say, just a few months ago, because it recognizes that the Myanmar military is perhaps far weaker than it ever estimated. I don't think that uh, China or most observers expected that the Myanmar military's uh, northeastern command uh, would have fallen in only 35 days of fighting. That was a real, I think, eye-opener for the Chinese and for many of the other resistance groups in the country because it really showed just how weak this Myanmar military has become. Yeah, so after the um, Lashu uh, Northeastern Command headquarters fell, China really at that point, I think, recognized just how weak the Myanmar military had become and how much this conflict was becoming existential for the Myanmar military. China's real interest was not in toppling the Myanmar military or in supporting revolutionary actors to do that. What China was more interested in was trying to get the northern EAOs and the Myanmar military back to the negotiating table and ultimately to get those parties to facilitate some sort of a deal that would enable the facilitation of trade and which would help ultimately de-escalate the situation more broadly in Burma. And so I think, you know, after... Lashu fell, the Chinese began to pivot towards, one, putting a lot more pressure on the northern EAOs along its border, which all rely on China for access to the Chinese economy, for mm-hmm. access to electricity and energy, as well as for access to other important resources, even things like banking are, are facilitated generally through China. So there's growing pressure from the Chinese side uh, on the particularly the Brotherhood Alliance and the Chinese-speaking Myanmar National Democratic Alliance Army, which has become one of the real engines of the resistance. It's actually pushed them in the direction of publicly cutting off ties with the National Unity Government and with the PDF. Right. So I think, you know, as a next step now, you're seeing where China's really pushing to get countries in the region to resume business as normal with the Myanmar military It's bringing the Myanmar military into a lot of multilateral platforms. These are, of course, Chinese-led platforms like the Lance Kong Mekong Cooperation Forum or the the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. You've seen where you've had high-level military officials from Myanmar participate in both of those platforms recently. So Mm -hmm. I, I would say kind of China's next move here is really to push these parties much harder to come to some kind of a deal that can... Uh, de-escalate the situation. I think the Chinese pressure is likely to discourage um, deeper alliances between some of the northern EAOs and other resistance actors, including the PDFs. It could also have the impact of cutting off some of the weapons supplies to the People's Defense Forces. But what it's very unlikely to do is change the attitude and the position of the vast majority of the Myanmar people which is that the Myanmar military is not a legitimate government actor and really is something that um, the Myanmar people, I think, have committed to really deposing, you know, moving moving mm-hmm. on with a country that is free from the Myanmar military vis-a-vis the country's politics. And so I think that China is going to face some pretty significant obstacles to getting in place a deal that actually manages to stabilize the situation, uh, particularly if that deal... Uh, only involves, you know, the small segment of armed actors, the Brotherhood right. um, uh, Alliance and the Myanmar military. And I think this is also further complicated yep. by the fact that the Myanmar military has declared these parties very recently as terrorist organizations, which kind of undercuts, I think, China's move to bring them to the table. How is that going to happen if the Myanmar military is treating them as, as terrorist organizations? Right. Uh, in Rakhine State, the, the bloodshed, uh, and the uh, God, the, the never-ending uh, alleged genocide, but the, the never-ending bullying, picking on the Rohingya just doesn't seem to stop. What I'm hearing is, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that there's like $50 billion has been earmarked for development along the oil and gas pipeline through Rakhine up to Lasho. 
And there's a lot of land grabbing going on. And that's one of the reasons behind the bloodshed is that a lot of people in the military are eyeing that land. And hence the uh, Rohingya are being forced off. Are you hearing much along those lines? Or what do you suspect is behind the, the extraordinary type of fighting that seems to be going on uh, around Rakhine? Yeah, so I, I, I mean, I think that the position of the Arakan army has really not changed. Mm-hmm. It has ambitions to liberate all of what it sees as Arakan. So we're talking not only about uh, Rakhine proper, but also the southern part of Chin, including Palawa, which is already under the control of the Arakan army. The AA has made some pretty phenomenal progress on the battlefield, bringing at least nine key townships in Rakhine, plus the the southern township uh, I mentioned in, in Chin State under, yep. its, uh, under its control. The military, in turn, I think, is getting increasingly desperate because Rakhine is critical for access to the sea, but it's also critical when it comes to the oil and gas resources. It's critical when it comes to uh, the key infrastructure necessary to send all of the, the oil and gas off to China. And that mm-hmm. is one of the major sources of revenue for the Myanmar military. The AA has actually taken the township that is adjacent to the onloading station for the pipeline. Yep. Um, this is Rambri Township. has been brought under control of the AA. Now, you started to hear quite a lot of rumors and information about the Myanmar military forcibly conscripting Rohingya troops months ago. And you've also seen where the Myanmar military seems to have built some form of alliances with some of the Rohingya armed groups. Now, I think what's important is that many of these Rohingya armed groups that we're discussing are not groups that would really be representing at large the Rohingya people. Nonetheless, though, you see where the Myanmar military has increasingly tried to play the Rohingya card in terms of manipulating some of the intercommunal tensions that are there and present uh, in Rakhine State, uh, including the tensions that are there between um, Arakan people and uh, Rohingya. Right. And I think that that is something that has become you know, a real flashpoint of the conflict like now in Rakhine State. The Arakan army, of course, I think has many challenges insofar as the relationship between Arakan people and Rohingya people has never been uh, a good one. Sure. And so you've seen I, where also the AA has fallen into the trap a little bit of using extremely inflammatory language to refer to the Rohingya. You've seen where there are accusations made also that the AA is uh, not only recruiting Rohingya, but maybe even forcibly recruiting Rohingya. So you do see where the Rohingya community is being increasingly impacted by what's going on in Rakhine State. And of course, the AA taking over control of all this territory, I think, does raise some major concerns around whether Mm -hmm. people who have claims to that territory will ever be able to return. How is the AA going to manage all of this? So sadly for the Rohingya, which are one of the most vulnerable communities in the world, the situation, I think, for Rohingya groups just becomes more and more deplorable as both the AA and the Myanmar military are trying to exploit that community in different ways. They just can't seem to get a break, the Rohingya. It's just, uh, it's a never-ending story. And it's, this situation, I think, has put the uh, NUG on the back foot because they're in a position where they don't want to criticise the AA, the Arakan army, but one reads the press releases that are coming out of the NUG in regards to what's happening in Rakhine, and they're always trying to take a something of a step backwards. No one really wants to criticise the AA because, in the bigger scheme of things, they're on our side. But uh, I think the the AA has certainly uh, stirred up an enormous conflict of interest for everybody involved. Well, I, I think one of the key challenges here for the NUG is, on the one hand, it sees the, the Arakan army as a very significant and very powerful ethnic armed organization mm-hmm. that has a common enemy with the NUG, right? I mean, both sure. of them yeah. are, are looking to uh, eradicate the Myanmar military in different ways. And so, you know, as the NUG considers its alliances with ethnic armed organizations, it's hesitant to take steps to put pressure on the Arakan army. 
I think what would ultimately be most helpful in this situation is if the Aragon Army itself could look at how it might chart a different path for Rakhine State and for Aragon more broadly as it continues towards liberating more of this territory. You know, one of the challenges there, I think, is Mm -hmm. the Aragon Army has been trying to build some form of dialogue with Bangladesh. And I think it's also maybe leveraging the Rohingya issue a little bit in terms of trying to get more attention from Bangladesh with the hope that Bangladesh would open up the border and begin dealing with it as a a legitimate governance actor in Rakhine. But at the same time, you know, I mean, given the way in which the Myanmar military is manipulating that that situation, given the popular, I think, challenges that are there, intercommunal challenges that are there, I do see where you've also seen the AA make some pretty significant mistakes in terms of its messaging and its treatment of the Rohingya, which is going to make it, I think, very difficult for the AA to play that type of, of a role. And that's going to pose some big challenges to the NUG as well. Does the NUG want to, you know, come out and condemn the AA and then risk losing a key ally? uh, Or does it want to take more of a middle ground approach? But then that subjects it also to a lot of both domestic and international criticism as well. So this is a really tricky issue, I think, for the resistance uh, actors to, to manage. Yeah, uh, the NUG has this stated position, which uh, I'd just like your opinion on, that uh, in an ideal world, they would like to see the pre-war order restored, as in the members of parliament who were elected in November 2020, uh, basically handed back their government. Is that possible? I don't think that that's an accurate um, Mm. reflection of of the NUG position. I mean, I think at, at this point you've seen where... The NUG has, uh, similar to uh, many of the ethnic armed organizations, they've decided to really throw out the country's 2008 constitution, which was the constitution that was uh, authored by uh, the Myanmar military itself. And really what they're, they're looking to do is to chart a new pathway for federal democracy in the country. And so you do have instruments like the federal charter that have been developed by members of the resistance. And I think which represents uh, perhaps the vision of some of the members of the resistance for uh, the future of the country. Of course, beyond the NUG and some of the groups that it's aligned with, you also have the the challenges in so far as many of the powerful ethnic armed organizations up on the China border have a very different vision for the future. So I think what's most significant here is the position of the United Wa State Team or United Wa State Party, yeah. um, which is arguably the most powerful of uh, Myanmar's ethnic armed organizations and the one that has made the most progress of all towards its political objectives. And really, at this point, I would say the the, the UWSA, I mean, it's, it's not rejecting the current constitution of the country. Uh, it's basically just looking for federal level status. It's looking for a very high level of autonomy, and it's looking to ensure that all of its territory, both the northern enclave of the wall as well as the southern enclave of the wall, are given uh, very strong constitutional guarantees as a separate wall state, something that currently the constitution does not afford to the UWSA. Mm-hmm. And so I think, you know, one of the challenges with this is that some of the other ethnic armed organizations they're maybe a little bit on the fence still in terms of whether they're seeking revolutionary change. Um, Do they really want to go as far as completely eradicating the Myanmar military? Or is their bigger interest really in just creating a scenario where they have full autonomy over their areas, they get those areas recognized as federal units and as sort of fully autonomous uh, areas, but then similar to the law, they're more agnostic as to which party actually sits in the government in, in Nebida. And okay. I think that that's one of the challenges here is that while you've had uh, tremendous levels of battlefield coordination across these resistance actors in terms of their political vision, you know, you've seen that pace towards coming up with a unified political vision across all these actors has been slow. And again, I mean, this is a conflict that's been going on for more than 70 years. So I think it's important to recognize that 
given mm. that we're in our fourth year since the coup, we should have perhaps limited expectations as to how far things are going to go on the political side of things. Yeah, I think the bar's being set pretty low on that score, but uh, heading south east uh, down into Karen territory and Cayenne State, what's your take on uh, what happened in April with Miawati, the fall, the kind of hand back? I know there's a lot of KNL, KNU troops and the PDFs who are aligned with them who are pretty upset about how it's all panned out. Uh, how do you explain this one? It's a difficult one. Yeah, it's a difficult one, but, but I think if we sort of shift gears here to look a little mm. bit at what happened with the scam syndicates up on the, um, the Chinese Myanmar border and look a little bit at the fall of the Myanmar military's border guard force uh, up in Kokong, that being the Kokong border guard force, Yep. This does give some insight into sort of what played out uh, earlier this year in Karen State with the Karen Border Guard Force. I think the short story here is that the Chinese sent some pretty strong signals to the Myanmar military beginning from last May that they wanted to see a crackdown on all of these scam syndicates uh, right. on their border. Yep. And the Chinese were well aware that these scam syndicates were being protected, operated, and, and largely facilitated by the Myanmar military's border guard force up there. So after months of pressure, you know, I think you saw where the key enemy of that border guard force, the Myanmar National Democratic Alliance Army, which prior to 2009 actually controlled the territory where all of those scam compounds and scam syndicates uh, were located, it strategically launched a military operation called Operation 1027 with the objective of eradicating um, all of those scam syndicates. Mm -hmm. And it did this quite effectively. I would say you, you saw where China aligned a bit some of its own policing actions. It issued arrest warrants for the leaders of the Kokong Border Guard Force just as the MMDAA forces were closing in and uh, moving into the center of Laokai, where the vast majority of these scam compounds were located. And in the end, you saw under Chinese pressure that the Myanmar military actually handed over the heads of its own border guard force to the Chinese, to, right. to the Chinese police. It was a quite dramatic uh, operation that happened at the start of the year. I think in, in turn that this sent a chill to the Karen Border Guard Force, because after the fall of Kokong and the Kokong Border Guard Force scam compounds, it basically meant that the Karen Border Guard Force, headed by Chitthu, that they were the ones providing the vast majority of protection to Chinese scam syndicates in the country. And so right away you saw where Chitthu became very exposed. He saw that Perhaps the Myanmar military could do something quite harmful to his border guard force because of growing pressure from China. And I think he took some steps to try to protect his border guard force from a similar type of, of crackdown or alternatively a copycat type of, of military operation from emerging in the Karen territories. And what he did was basically he announced that rather than being a border guard force, that is militia group was transitioning into something known as the Karen National Army and that it would be neutral. And what this did is it shifted the power dynamics in the Karen areas and it led to the KNU and uh, its uh, military wing, um, the KNLA, launching a large offensive on the Myanmar military's uh, key base there at Miawati. Yep. That offensive was successful but it also led to the Myanmar military launching a very large military operation to come into the Karen areas and to try to take back that base. And so in order to uh, fight off that uh, military uh, counter move, the KNLA basically handed the Miawati area over to the Border Guard Force. And mm -hmm. the Border Guard Force, rather than partnering more closely with the KNLA, it instead decided to fly the Myanmar military's flag up in uh, Miawati at that base. And what that did was, of course, it, 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 it was, I think, a, a sign of betrayal to the KNLA. It was the KNA showing its true colors, that it actually was still a border guard force. But what it also did was it 
basically made the Myanmar military much, much more reliant on the border guard force in order to maintain its presence on the Thai border along the key transportation corridor there. Yeah. And so the ultimate outcome of this is that now the Myanmar military has very limited ability to do anything to pressure the border guard force into cracking down on scam syndicates. And at the same time, by indicating that it's neutral, the border guard force also can give the Myanmar military space to turn around to the Chinese or turn around to Thailand or other countries and say, oh, well, actually, that territory is under the control of a neutral entity. We can't really access that territory. There's not much that we can do about it. So it enables those parties to deflect blame from one another, but it also puts the border guard force in a stronger position because it now has more control over more territory than it had before. And it's also in a position, I think, where it's increasingly reaching out to some of the ethnic armed organizations, trying to co-opt them into the criminal activity. So you really have not seen a crackdown on criminal activity in the Karen lands. Instead, you've seen an expansion of those scam syndicates on um, the Myanmar border with Thailand. Right. While we're on this subject, this point in the conversation, I think USIP has done a terrific job with your reports on the scam compounds and human trafficking and also raising awareness in Congress. As we all know, without the United States in there and exerting pressure, not a lot's going to happen. And America is having a difficult year with the elections upcoming. A lot of things go on hold because of elections. But they did come out last week and uh, impose sanctions in Cambodia on Leong Fat. Uh, for his alleged ties to uh, human trafficking and scam compounds. But what I'm trying to drive at, do you see uh, the United States Congress, the Magnitsky Act, all the the armament that uh, the American bureaucracy has, do you see that becoming a bigger factor in terms of cracking down on human trafficking and the scam compounds going forward? Well, I, I think the first thing to recognize here is that this, this is becoming a major security threat to the United States. As China has cracked down on the house on its border and as it sends signals to uh, the scam syndicates and those uh, protecting the scam syndicates that the Chinese police are aiming to to end you know, all of the scamming and, and these massive capital outflows from China, what is happening is that the crime groups, they're not ending their criminal activity, they're pivoting, right? I mean, they're mm-hmm. pivoting to use these very sophisticated scamming methodologies that they perfected in China targeting Chinese over the past five, six years, they're pivoting to use all of these same sorts of tactics to scam Americans, to scam Europeans. And so while the Chinese police are reporting now, you know, record drop-offs in the number of victims of online scams, um, I think they're reporting as of uh, June of this year, a 30% year-on-year decrease in the value of funds stolen from these online scams, you're seeing in the U.S. that losses are off the charts. Um, right. We saw that there was just uh, new data released by the FBI putting a number of around uh, $5.5 billion U.S. dollars. And that's, I think, a, a very, very, very much an underestimate because the vast majority of, of losses to these scams go mm-hmm. unreported. So this is a big challenge for the U.S., and it's becoming bigger as... China gets more involved in cracking down, but cracking down somewhat selectively uh, yep. on this. I think it's also a national security threat to the U.S. because you see that the Chinese police are becoming much, much more active uh, internationally on this. And China is increasingly linking a crackdown on this form of criminality and a crackdown on online scamming and telecommunications fraud to its global security initiative. Yep. So in some senses, you're seeing where the Chinese are politicizing this and where they're also using it to gain access for their police to many of these other countries, which could increase China's police influence in many spaces across the world. Mm-hmm. So the U.S. has been a key provider of police assistance internationally. It's been trying to reinforce democratic values of policing overseas. So this, I think, also is another level of threat as China continues to get in, involved in this. I think the last thing on this related to Myanmar that we've also seen, and this goes back to our conversation about China's sudden pivot towards yep. the Myanmar military and away from the resistance forces, 
It's actually been resistance forces in Myanmar that have been the ones that have been cracking down on the criminal activity. And so now that China recognizes that the Myanmar military is kind of getting to the point where this is becoming existential, it's now doing more to try to help the Myanmar military. It's doing much less, actually, to support efforts by resistance groups to crack down on on criminal activity. Mm -hmm. So it's creating some disincentives, I think, for more of these types of operations or more movements by ethnic armed organizations to address the problem. And that means you have people like Du and like this Karen Border Guard Force who are able to scale up these criminal operations in impunity, but they do it now targeting much, much more the U.S. and other countries around the world. So, you know, I think if the U.S. doesn't get involved in this, you're going to see that U.S. losses continue to escalate and that, um, you know, instances of human trafficking of, of people from across the world continue to, to rise, yep. but also that the Chinese police are going to use this to gain uh, advantage internationally. So this really is something that the U.S. needs to be involved in, both in Myanmar and I think in other countries across the region. And that's why I think this move to, to begin targeting more of these compound owners in places like Cambodia is, is an important one, but it can't stop there. I mean, you really have to look at this kind of at the global level and really, I think, to try to get more support from other countries both in putting sanctions on the individuals and criminal actors that are enabling all of this Mm -hmm. scamming and facilitating this activity, uh, but then also to put in place a whole range of other protections to ensure that it doesn't spread to other parts of the world. Right. I I thought the involvement of uh, U.S. Treasury was interesting in terms of the uh, imposing the sanctions in that once the U.S. dollar is undermined, I think the last, latest figure I saw was an Interpol figure was a $3 trillion industry. If that's going to undermine the U.S. currency, given it is the global currency, whether people like it or not, once Treasury gets involved, it's really kicked up to a whole new level. Yeah, and I, I think perhaps one reason why you saw where this sanction you know, targeted uh, one of the key perpetrators in, in Cambodia is because Cambodia is, in fact, a dollar economy. And right. so, you know, that the activity would be taking place there, I think, does actually represent a very significant threat to the Treasury Department. But, you know, panning out a little bit, I think it's also important to recognize that the vast majority of these scams are taking place in cryptocurrencies. Mm-hmm. And the money is also being laundered and moved by individuals and, and money mules that are operating also in, in, in crypto. Next step on this, I think, is really going to be taking a much closer look at how better regulation of cryptocurrencies can be put in place. And mm-hmm. then also to look how a lot of these different cryptocurrency platforms are linking up with the formal financial institutions. Right. Um, that's not well understood as to exactly how criminal actors are are moving these funds out of crypto and into the formal financial system, but they're definitely doing that. And they're utilizing a range of new fintech applications to do this. You know, you're seeing where there's a growing number of these applications that permits the almost seamless transfer of crypto into a range of different fiat currencies. Yep. Um, so I think that these are the areas where it's important for the U.S. to start taking a, a much closer look at is really how do you protect financial systems from this? How do you protect the, the formal banking system from this? But then also, how do you better regulate crypto and get other countries around the world to do a much better job of regulating cryptocurrencies? I guess it's important to point out, though, that there's also been a lot of interesting innovation across the region in looking at how to deal with some of these challenges. For example, in in, in Singapore, you now have this new anti-scam center that's been stood up over the past two years, which actually has banks working directly with police almost in real time, kind of all housed in the same space. And that seems to be quite helpful in terms of when you have these suspicious transactions, whether they're identified by the banks or identified by the police, that it enables mm-hmm. uh, uh, these, these, these transactions to be frozen before the funds uh, get, get drawn away, sometimes before they get drawn into the different cryptocurrency platforms. With the crypto platforms and, and with the fact that you have many countries that are just simply deciding not to regulate at all, that opens up the whole globe to a lot of additional financial risk, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, these platforms 
whether they're banned in places like China or they're regulated in places like the U.S., you know, they're open platforms that people are able to deal with regardless of, of where they're actually sitting. Right. And I think that that does open a range of new challenges when it comes to combating money laundering that we really don't have a viable strategy for, for dealing with at this point. Uh, Jason, it's been a terrific chat. Uh, we are starting to run out of time, but emerging out of the COVID pandemic, we were confronted by a very different world, particularly with human trafficking and uh, the scam compounds, the, the war in Myanmar, it all seemed to converge in uh, this part of the world. But where we're going next, there does seem to be some kind of clarity in that uh, well, the human traffickers have the world's attention. The military is not going to win the conflict in uh, Myanmar. So I, I guess 2025 is going to shape up for a all telling year. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess looking into 2025, you're likely to see kind of over the next couple of months, at least in terms of the Myanmar crisis, that China is going to try to push the, the ethnic armed organizations in the north to come to some form of a deal with the Myanmar military. Mm. I think there's a big question, though, as to whether that's going to be feasible or whether you'll end up seeing talks collapse once again. I think at the same time, you know, the Myanmar military is at a historical weak point. Internally, it's showing growing signs of major challenges. For example, it's having to rely on forced conscription in order to replenish troops. Mm -hmm. It's having to become almost fully aligned with China strategically in order to really be able to gain the international support necessary to survive. So things are quite existential, and I think we'll see some pretty significant development in terms of the conflict in, in Myanmar, with the trajectory of the conflict not being very favorable for the Myanmar military, unless the Myanmar military wants to increasingly align with China in exchange for more strategic support. I think then pivoting to these awful issues, and these are really global issues around the forced labor uh, scamming that's going on both in, in Myanmar, Cambodia, Laos, and elsewhere uh, across the region. One of the big concerns that's there is, yes, you have some crackdowns underway. There's some positive things that we're seeing. I think, for example, in the Philippines, which we haven't talked about uh, much here mm -hmm. uh, yet, there's been this recent ban on the online casino operators or the POGOs. And the law enforcement in the Philippines really does show a strong sign of, of going after some of the key kingpins that are involved in online scamming in that particular country. And so you've seen takedown of this, yep. this local mayor, Alice Kua, who was sort of secretly behind a couple of these major scam compounds and operations in the Philippines. And I think we're going to see a lot more movement there. We're similarly seeing some crackdowns recently in Laos in the Golden Triangle Economic Zone. But the problem is, is that the criminals have become so embedded in many different places around the world. And I think that's one of the things that we tried to highlight with that report that I mentioned earlier in the call, yep. is that transnational crime, and particularly these PRC origin crime groups, have become very powerful, and they've built kind of hubs in so many different places across the world. It gives them the opportunity to move their business, to pivot their business. If there's a crackdown in Laos, they move down to the Myanmar Thai border. If there's a crackdown on the China border, they move into Cambodia again. So there's far too many spaces, I think, where there aren't crackdowns, where it's very easy for these operations to continue in impunity. And despite, you know, the growing efforts to raise awareness about this and to combat the trafficking, you haven't really seen where the pace of the losses are slowing down, or have you seen where the pace of the victimization of more people around the globe is slowing down? The picture is pointing in the opposite direction. And I think if you look overall at a lot of the projections for you know, what's going to happen with telecommunications fraud and online scamming more broadly. I mean, the projections are for massive growth over the coming five to 10 years in these online scams and in losses from online scams. Yes. And I think the challenge is going to be, how does law enforcement start to catch up? How do you start to deal with the corruption that enables this? And, and thus far, I think we're, we're making only very slow progress, whereas the criminal actors behind this 
are at the cutting edge of technology and they're incorporating AI into the scamming and they're doing a whole lot of things that are making the scamming much more efficient, much more lethal and much more difficult to track. So I think this this is going to be looking into 2025 a key challenge, both in terms of combating the human trafficking uh, and combating, you know, the uh, kidnapping and tricking of people into these scam centers, as well as combating, you know, high levels of losses that I think are only going to get higher uh, in 2025 unless major action is taken. Right. Uh, yeah, the brave new world is upon us and uh, hide your money. It's going to be a, a bumpy ride, I think. Jason Tower, Country Director for Burma with the United States Institute for Peace. Thank you very much. It was an enthralling chat. Terrific insights. Thank you. Thanks, Luke. Thanks again for having me on. It was great having a chance to catch up with you. Yeah, we'll do it all again soon. Thanks.